you ever forget anything? You know, we need the Lord to help us uh, all the time to remember things. And, uh, and so, uh, Jimmy, uh, we appreciate your singing, and we appreciate the fact that you trust in the Lord to give you help in, in your memory. This morning, I want to bring a message on the will of God, on knowing and doing God's will. You know, it's so very important that we know the will of God for our lives. Otherwise, we're going through just struggling, and we make one step after another, and we don't know where we're going unless we have some kind of divine direction for our lives. Would you all agree that we need divine direction? We need to know God's will for our lives. He said, be not uh, blind or be not under uh, the false assumption that you have complete control. Be not wise in your own eyes, he said. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And then he said, this is the will of God, that you know his will. Now, when you consider the will of God, uh, in uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, he said, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I mean, it is the will of God for everybody to be saved. God does not want any person to go to hell. And yet people are going to hell because they refuse God's way. And no one, listen, no one could ever, ever go to hell and say it was God's fault because he did everything possible to provide salvation in Jesus Christ. I mean, the Bible says God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And the Bible said God is not willing that people should perish. In fact, he tells us uh, in, uh, in Timothy, who, who wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And so uh, if anybody is lost, if anybody leaves this world and goes to hell, which is a very real place, is as real as Fruitland Park, a place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, where there's eternal sorrow and eternal, eternal torment. Think about how awful that place is. God doesn't want you there. He prepared the, de the hell for the devil. He's going to put Satan there, and Satan is going to be suffering there forever and ever. And Satan is already a defeated foe, and uh, the Lord is going to show his power and one day cast Satan in the lake of fire. I mean, we're going to be rejoicing. If you're saved, you're going to be clapping your hand. You're say he's finally going to get what he deserves. The Bible said he's going to hell. God prepared that awful place to suffer, to suffer uh, so that Satan could suffer. But listen, some people are going to hell. And Jesus said, wide and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. But he said, narrow is the way, and straight is the gate that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. And it's a sad thing that people are lost, and I, was, I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night thinking, Oh, God, don't let anybody from our congregation, don't let any of these people hear the gospel and turn a, a deaf ear to God's working and his wooing in their hearts. Lord, don't let anybody come to church here and go out into a Christless eternity. Don't let anyone die and go to hell. And yet, I'm aware that God won't force you to accept Christ. He's not willing that you should perish but he leaves that choice to you. And if you choose the wrong way, if you choose to turn away from Jesus, there is no other way. There is no other way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said, I'm it. I'm the, your way. I'm going to Calvary. I'm going to suffer and bleed and die for you. I'm going to have your sins laid on me. I'm going to pay the full price for your sins so you can have everlasting life. But if you reject Christ and hold on to your sins instead of turning to him from your sins and letting him forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of your sins, if you turn away from Jesus, you're going to be lost for all eternity. Throughout the ceaseless years of eternity, you'll be suffering and friend, you will remember 
If you're here without Christ and you die without him, you're going to remember this service. Jesus said, the rich man lift up his eyes, being in torment, and said, I'm tormented in this flame. And he said, send someone back that they can tell my five brothers that they will not come to this awful place. He remembered. Then it was said to him, son, remember, in your lifetime you had good things. You had opportunity, but you didn't receive. You turned away. It has been a burden in my heart today to think that there might be somebody in this service Somebody that hear the word of God and come short of putting your confidence and faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That burdens my heart. The apostle Paul said, who is sufficient for these things? And I understand what he meant. How can we bear the thought, does someone become to church in a loving place like this and hear the message that Jesus loves you and died for you and he Paid the full price for your soul's salvation, and yet to think you'd turn away from him. What a sad, sad thought that is. It's God's will that you be saved. It is God's will that you turn to Jesus and receive forgiveness of your sins and receive his gift of everlasting life. That is the will of God. But then the Bible has a lot to say about the will of God for those of us who have trusted Christ. He, he has much to say about it. And in fact, he says it in clear and absolutely plain terms. As an example, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in verse 3, he says, this is the will of God. Now, I don't believe anybody can misunderstand that, do you? I have sometimes people say, well, it's just your interpretation. Now, I don't know how in the world you could interpret that except this is the will of God. I mean, it's as clean, as plain as it could possibly be, right? All right, so let's look and see what it is. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. The word sanctification means holiness. It's God's will that you live a holy life. And uh, the word means separated from sin and separated to God. There's a two-fold separation there. He's talking about sanctification. He said, you need to be away from sin. Pull yourself away from it. Abstain from the, all appearance of evil. And then yield your life to God. That's sanctification. But then he explains it in detail. And he said, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, what he's talking about is moral purity. It is the will of God that those who name the name of Christ should depart from iniquity. It is the will of God that if you name the name of Christ, that you should not be involved in sexual sins. This is clearly given. This is the will of God. You follow that? Now, somebody said, well, you Baptists are so narrow. I, no, it's not Baptist. It's the word of God. <laughs> this is what God said. This is the will of God that you should abstain from sexual sin. Now, when he says abstain from fornication, the word means any kind of sexual intimacy outside of marriage between a man who is the husband and a woman who is his wife. It's sad we have to explain it in these days, isn't it? I mean, some people don't even know what a man is or what a woman is. They ask one of the senators, what is a woman? They said, we don't know. <laughs> you know, it's absolutely it's absurd. But they don't know. They say they don't, they don't want to define it. Listen, when the Bible said God made man, he made him male and female. I mean, that's God's doing. There's no other. I mean, everything else is simply a man's imagination. But God made him male and female. And then he said, for this cause shall a male, a man, leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. I mean, any other sexual activity outside of that, God said, is against his will. Is there any misunderstanding there? I don't think there could be. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, I'm, I'm not making a big issue out of that except for this. We're living in a licentious age. 
People, things are getting worse and worse, and they're pushing this immorality on our kids in school, in pre-kindergarten, and they're pushing this homosexual stuff and this lesbian stuff and this transgender stuff and living together and all of that kind of foolishness, and we're living in the middle of that age. Somebody has to stand up for what God said. Amen. Now, realize... But some people won't like that. You know what? I wasn't called to please people. I was called to preach this book, and God said it, God means it, and God is going to enforce it. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification that you should abstain from, stay away from sexual immorality. Well, now let's go to the second thing. Over in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, he mentions another thing that's the will of God. And you know, he said in verse 18, he said, In everything give thanks, for notice the words, This is the will of God. Did you see that? Isn't that clear and plain? How can anybody misunderstand that? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. How does you not have an attitude of gratitude? He wants you not only to be morally pure, he wants you to have a good attitude. He wants you to have a, an attitude of thanksgiving, of being thankful to God for all of his blessings. God has been so good. Now, it's easy for us to give thanks when all is well, but you know, she said, in everything, give thanks. In everything. Now, in other words, when things are going really well and, boy, you feel strong and you're good and healthy and you got a good appetite and you get up and go and do as you please, all is well. Thank God. Thank God that you have the ability to see and hear and smell and taste and touch and move around and handle things and walk with balance. And thank God that you have a nice house to live in and a bed to sleep in and food to eat and clothes to wear, shoes on your feet and have good friends. Thank God that your sins are forgiven. You have a home in heaven. Amen. Thank God you have an eternity with Jesus Christ. Amen. In everything, when it's well, give thanks. Oh, but, but, but wait a minute. Everything would include the bad things, wouldn't it? Now, would, you, would you see? In everything, give thanks. In other words, when everything goes south and everything turns bad, you're still to have a thankful heart. You be like that fellow up in Georgia cut his finger off. And uh, wow. He said, thank God it wasn't my hand. And, you know, someone else picked it up and said, well, if it was your hand, thank God it wasn't your arm. <laughs> and if it was your arm, you say, thank God it wasn't my leg. I mean, you find something to give thanks for no matter what happens or what you go through. In everything, give thanks. In, in the middle of trouble, and heartache and pain and discomfort and all of those things. When you're aching all over, give thanks. This is the will of God. You see, God wants you to give him thanks at all times, in every season, under every circumstance, in all situations, in everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, it's interesting that God gives these things so clearly and that we can't miss them. Oh, another place would be, you know, he says over in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he said, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for the, you're, you're, you know your labor's not in vain in the Lord. Do you see what he's saying? He said, it's my will for you to be active in the work of God. It is not the will of God for you to come and sit in church on Sunday and think you've done God a favor and not get active in his work. I'm not scolding you. I'm just telling you that's not the will of God. 
You see, the will of God is what he said, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, when he's saying be steadfast and unmovable, he says you can't be shaken. Don't be easily shaken. And there are some people, you know, that just are so easily shaken. And uh, you see them this week. You don't see them for a couple of weeks. You see them another week. And uh, they're just moving back and forth. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And you see, he said be steadfast. And then he said unshaken. Don't let anything shake you. I, it bothers me after all these years in the ministry when I talk to somebody and they said, well, I dropped out of church because so-and-so offended me. Man, the devil's got your number. All he has to do to get you out, if you ever get back in, to get somebody to say something bad to you and you're gone again. The devil's got control of you. I mean, the Bible says, be you steadfast, unmovable. Oh, that sounds to me like somebody would be hard to move them if they're unmovable. Think about that for a minute. This is what he's telling us. Get in, get involved, stay in. Don't let anything shake you. Be unshakable in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord, there's going to be a reward for those who serve him. And he said, I'm going to take care of you both now and I'll take care of you when you get to, to glory and you stand before the judgment seat. There's going to be a crown for you. Hey, just stay at it. Just stay at it. We're living in an age when uh, people don't want to be loyal anymore. You know, uh, and uh, I grew up in an age when uh, we were taught to be loyal. In fact, the Bible teaches loyalty. The very first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's loyalty. I mean, that's just loyalty. But we have people today, I, I, they just skip from one church to another church to another church. Don't ever want to be loyal to a church and get involved and serve God in that place. They just hop, skip it out. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to get uh, to be committed to doing anything on a steady, regular basis. Isn't that sad? I mean, it's sad. Now, as a pastor, I'm going to tell you how, how I feel this morning. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> I, I, here's the thing. I think people ought to be loyal to their pastor. If they're going to be in church, they ought to be loyal. Man, when I was a member of a church, I wouldn't let anybody say anything bad about a pastor to me. I mean, he'd have a fist fight. I mean, he really would. I, I remember very well the first time I was ever called uh, to assistant pastor. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I got up to preach that first time, and I said, I'm going to tell you folks something right now. I want you to get this and write it down. I didn't say it, but my brother would have said, carve it in your arm. I, that kind of bothers me. But anyway, I said, here it is. I don't want anybody in this church to ever come to me thinking you can criticize the pastor of this church. I will tell him. I will get you and you and I together will go and we'll make you say in front of him what you said in front of me. I said, I'm going to be loyal to my pastor. As long as he's preaching this book and holding truth, I'm unashamedly standing with him. My goodness, we don't have that kind of thing these days, it seems like. You know, if you can't be loyal, get up and go somewhere else where you can be loyal. Because people in the work of God need to have loyalty. And I'll guarantee you, this pastor will be loyal to you. I'll stand for you. I'll fight for you. I'll shed my blood for you. I'll stand up for this church. This is God's church in his place. And we're going to stand for it. We stand for the truth of God. Unashamedly, unabashedly, this is it. Hey, are you with me? Are you with me? Well, I ought to be there. Be unashamed at it. And if I ever make you ashamed, run me off. If I ever make you ashamed, you know, tar and feather me, put me out of town. I mean, I, I'm standing for you but I expect you to stand for me and stand for this church. We need loyalty. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding 
in the work of the Lord. This is his work in this place. Be there. All right. There's another thing that I think the Lord is really uh, considering when he says about knowing his will. Over in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says in verse 17, if you look at it, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Okay, what is the will of the Lord? He's going to give us another lesson. Are you ready for the next one? I mean, you know moral purity, right? You got that down for sure. You know, having an attitude of thanksgiving to God in all circumstances, no matter what, you got that. You know, always abounding in the work of the Lord, just overflowing in the work of God. Now, watch this one. He said, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Look at verse 18. He describes it. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess or riotousness. Christian people ought not to be out to a drink of wine, getting drunk. That's wrong. But he said, in contrast to that, be ye filled with the Spirit. Now, he said that's the will of God. Is that what I said, Brother Don? I mean, don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, that's is about as clear as anything can be. God wants you filled with the Spirit. He wants every one of his children to be filled with the Spirit. Now, you know what that means. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, a sanctuary, a temple, a place of worship, a place where God is adored and, and, and worshiped. Now, watch this. God wants that Holy Spirit who lives in you to have complete possession of you. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. I mean, I have no agenda of my own. His agenda is mine. That's what it means. I, I, I want to be so filled with Him that I would be directed in my thinking, in my feeling, in my wishing, and in my wanting, in all the hungers of my life, everywhere I go, everything I do, everything I say, I'm yielded to Him filled with him so he can guide me in all things. I pointed this out before, but remember over in the book of Acts where it said the Bible said they were filled with fear. Same word. Now, what happens when a person is filled with fear? Everything about them is controlled by fear, right? If you're filled with fear, <laughs> you, it controls you. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been filled with fear? Oh, I've been there. I know what it's like. I was in a tornado once. <laughs> and I'll tell you, you can get filled with fear pretty quick. Yeah. And, and it means it controls you fully if you're filled with fear. But when you're filled with the Spirit, you're so yielded to Him that you're ready to do whatever He impresses on your heart to do. If he leads you to do something, you do it. If he leads you to give something, you give it. If he leads you to pray, you pray. If he leads you to get a hold of somebody on the phone, you do so. Whatever the Lord leads you to do, that's what you do. Now, how many of us ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Is there any misunderstanding there? I mean... Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine, what is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Oh, what it would be if God's Holy Spirit had his way completely in all of our lives. What would it be if the Spirit of God had complete control of our thinking and we wouldn't turn over in our minds anything that would be grieving or quenching of the Holy Spirit. We'd get rid of all that bad feelings and bitterness and unforgiveness and all that kind of foolishness, and we would be filled with the love of God because the fruit of the Spirit is love. And when He has complete control, we have joy. I mean, we really rejoice. And, and it wouldn't hurt some of you to start rejoicing a little bit. 
If you come in with a sour face, leave with a sour face. I mean, hey, that's not the will of God. Come on. God wants you to be filled with joy. Love, joy, peace. He wants to have the peace of God in your life. And all of the fruit of the Spirit, that's the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You get it? Do you want to be in the will of God? I was up early this morning praying, the Lord, don't let anybody leave here without knowing the will of God. I don't want anybody to misunderstand it. Everybody, even some who you have to say it three times, four times. <laughs> Not you. But I want to make sure everybody gets it. That no one can leave saying, I didn't know it was wrong for me to do this or that. I, the Bible teaches moral purity, the will of God. The Bible teaches a thankful heart, a grateful life, the will of God. The Bible teaches to being active, always in the work of God. That's the will of God. Now, the Bible teaches it's God's will for you to be filled with the Spirit. Not drunk with wine, but filled with the Holy Spirit. Letting the Holy Spirit guide you. One more thing. Well, you see how quickly this passes by when you're listening? Watch this. The Apostle Paul was coming up to the end of his life. He was in prison in Rome, and he had already had the sentence passed. He was going to die. And the Apostle Paul said, you know, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, would give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Did you see it? He said the same thing over in Titus chapter 2. And, and in Titus 2, he said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly, in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. Now, you see what he is saying there? He wants to make a people peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, did you notice he said, he said, we're looking for that appearing. We're looking for that blessed hope. The will of God is that we live in light of the second coming of Christ. That's pretty clear, isn't it? I mean, the apostle Paul said, the Lord's going to give a reward to everybody that loves his appearing. We need to love it. And then he said, looking for it, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. Jesus could come back today. Jesus is God. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful to see Jesus today? Wouldn't it be wonderful? I mean, and, uh, instead of having to walk the veil with him, we just meet him in the air. What a glory that would be just to see Jesus. And it is the will of God in Christ Jesus that you love his appearing. You're looking for his appearing. You're living in the light of his appearing every day of your life. Jesus is coming. The songwriter said, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. And you know, it may be before noon today. It may be that we would be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and ever be with the Lord. Amen. Look, look, love it, live it. Jesus is coming. This is the will of God that you live in the light of the second coming of Christ. Amen.